can explore. The other systems are also called galaxies, or sometimes nebulae. Some galaxies are flattened, with spiral arms like our own. Others are round, like footballs, or oval, like rugby balls. Still others, quite irregular in shape. Galaxies show a distinct tendency to be collected into groups. These groups are called clusters. A single cluster may contain hundreds or thousands of individual galaxies, each of which, like our own, may contain many millions of stars. Clusters of galaxies are found, in their turn, to be grouped into larger entities, called superclusters. A supercluster may be 30 million to 100 million or more light years across. Despite the aggregation of stars into galaxies, galaxies into clusters and clusters into superclusters, it is usually supposed that on a sufficiently large scale the universe is approximately uniform and that the part of it which is observable with existing instruments may be typical of the universe as a whole. This idea that the universe is uniform on a large scale, which was suggested long before there was adequate astronomical evidence for it, has now acquired the status of a fundamental postulate. It is usually called the cosmological principle. The cosmological principle is really only an extension of Copernicus's ideas. As soon as we give up the egotistical notion that the earth is at the centre of all things, we are forced to realise that the sun, which is an ordinary star, has no more claim than the earth to a special place in our description of the universe. There is one very remarkable phenomenon which might lead us to suppose that our local cluster of galaxies does have a special position in the universe. But we shall see that this is illusory. It is the so-called red shift in the spectra of distant galaxies, from which we deduce the idea that the universe is expanding. If a hooting car goes past you, the pitch of the horn appears to drop. The effects are very similar in the case of light. If the source of light is moving towards you, then the whole spectrum of the light is shifted towards the violet. If the source is moving away from you, then the whole spectrum is shifted towards the red. The amount of the shift depends on the rate of change of the distance between you and the light source. It has nothing to do with the speed of the light itself, which is, of course, independent of the motion of its source. This shift of the spectrum provides a means of determining the speeds of stars and galaxies. The speeds of galaxies in the local group, measured in this way, range up to about 500 kilometres a second. This is very fast by everyday standards, but because of the great distances between the galaxies, it will be millions of years before there was any noticeable change in their position. Some of the galaxies in the local group are moving towards us, others away from us. There is nothing very remarkable about this motion, which might be compared to the motion of bees in a swarm. The bees move about relative to one another, but the swarm as a whole keeps together. The situation is rather different when we come to examine clusters other than our own. Here again, there are internal motions in each cluster, but all the other clusters appear to be moving away from our own and the further away they are, the faster they appear to be moving. Because all the other clusters appear to be moving away from us, we might be inclined to think that the local group is in some way at the centre of the expanding universe. This would be a mistake, because it ignores the relative character of motion. Consider our bees. Suppose that they are very well-trained swarms, which hover above the ground ten metres apart, in a line running from west to east. Then suppose that one of the swarms stays at rest, relative to the ground, while the swarm ten metres to the east of it moves east at a metre a minute. The swarm twenty metres to the east moves east at two metres a minute, and so on, while the swarms to the west of the fixed swarm move west at similar speeds. Then it will appear to a bee in any of the swarms, fixed or moving, that all the other swarms are receding at speeds proportional to their distances. If the ground were not available as a reference point, there would be no reason to think that any one of the swarms was picked out in a special way. The behaviour of the clusters of galaxies is entirely similar. 
Of course, they are distributed irregularly in all directions, not lined up like our well-trained swarms. But it will appear to an observer in any cluster that all the others are receding. Since there is no absolute standard of rest in the universe, the appearance of expansion is the same for all the clusters. Let us now examine how this information about the universe can be fitted into the general relativity theory. We have seen that the gravitational effects of the sun may be described as those of a hill in space-time. A galaxy, a cluster, or a supercluster may be represented in the same way, but by a much larger hill because of its much greater mass. In order to simplify the description, we begin by constructing models which preserve what seem to be the essential features while leaving out the geographical details. The features which we preserve are the large-scale uniformity and the expansion. The details left out are the precise positions and compositions of the individual galaxies. Thus we construct model space-times to represent the universe by supposing it to be exactly, instead of approximately, uniform. Matter smoothed out into a continuous distribution. Just as the accumulation of matter into an aggregate can be described by saying that there is a large hill in space-time where we see the aggregate, or by saying that space-time is curved near to that aggregate, so the uniform distribution of matter in a smoothed-out model of the universe can be described by saying that space-time is curved uniformly. This overall curvature of the universe is somewhat analogous to the curvature of a sphere in ordinary space, but it is inappropriate to push the analogy further, because this can easily become misleading. The relativity law of gravitation, combined with a smoothing out assumption, allows us to construct a variety of models of the universe, in which the overall curvature takes a variety of different forms. The main effect of this overall curvature is that it implies in some models that the spectra of distant objects will be shifted towards the red. The model universes which we have been considering, agree more or less well with observations of the overall properties of our own universe. There are others, equally consistent with the new law and with the assumption of uniformity, in which there is a blue shift corresponding to a contraction of the universe instead of a red shift. The existence of such models is no reason for rejecting the new theory. It implies that the theory is not complete. Some additional assumption is required which will exclude the unwanted models. Let us examine the consequences of expansion a little further, remembering always that what we say may always be rephrased in terms of space-time curvature, if that becomes necessary. The most obvious consequence is that if the clusters of galaxies are getting farther and farther apart, then in the past they must have been closer together. Suppose we were to take a film of the expanding universe over millions of years, recording the whole history of the expansion. If the film were then shown backwards, all the clusters of galaxies would appear to get closer and closer together, until, presumably, they were so close together that there were no gaps between them anymore. Still further back, we may suppose, even the spaces between the stars will be filled up with highly condensed hot gas out of which the stars could have evolved. Recent astronomical observations of short radio waves confirm the existence of this highly condensed state. All this is rather speculative, but it is very likely that the universe evolved from a highly condensed state, and it is even more likely that such a highly